Okay, no worries. Leanne, it is so lovely to meet you. And you, thanks for having me. Oh, <laughs> so we're gonna do something completely different. And again, this recording, if we just wanna keep it private, that's fine. But we okay. might wanna put it on my web series because okay. I've been doing this, which is basically getting on an impromptu first meeting with a stranger, yep. okay. demonstrating racial harmony, demonstrating Americans who can actually know about places around the globe. Mm -hmm. And I think that that starts to model this world that we need to create. Mm -hmm. Our, you can't just tell people things. We want to show them. We want to show that strangers can have a lovely time together. Yeah. Now, Paul Carrick Brunson established a lot of trust. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, in a certain way saying this can just randomly happen immediately. You know, you have to sort of know that you're going to meet somebody whose heart's open, that you've got a nice little background. Like LinkedIn is the perfect place to go. This is not just a chat. I now know who you are as a professional. And I want to talk about physiotherapy as <laughs> the way to reverse Parkinson's. Okay. Most especially young onset Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. I had a business partner who developed Parkinson's. He was in the uh, Leeds Sheffield area, now okay. much closer to you. Okay. And um, we met on LinkedIn. Young onset at 36. He was okay. committed to a care home a year or so ago before he turned 50. The rest of his life will be on Her Majesty's dime because of yeah. Parkinson's. There's a real big Parkinson's problem in the UK. And I have, because I was his co-founder, because I did a lot of um, looking into the brain research as a yeah. philosopher, I really truly think I have a better theory than everyone else because it unifies, okay? And I thought first person access every single day I eat, with, with somebody like this. I got to watch him have dyskinesia. I got to really, how do I keep talking to him when the, when the L does, because he can't control. You see how I can embody dyskinesia. Mm. Mm. I learned it kind of like Bob De Niro did when he was in that movie Awakenings. Yeah. I got this really special gift. I understand embodiment, so I don't have Parkinson's. But over the last few years as I've been pulling this hypothesis, so this is a philosophical hypothesis. Yeah. See, so experts are gonna have to come in and design the research. Experts are gonna need to vet me. But I have this, I mean, this is, this is a high quality product. Like this is, I need an astute sort of board of directors kind of person like yourself who knows the industry is gonna get what I'm saying here about physiotherapy being the way to reverse Parkinson's. Everyone's putting stuff in the brain and got the digest. There's so many hypotheses. This is craziness, right? It's a brain disease. It's something to do with the afferent efferent communications of the body. Yeah. Now here's where I'm gonna take you for a tangent and you're gonna love it. Obesity, morbid obesity is a Parkinsonism. Mm -hmm. I just lost 140 pounds in the 50th year of my life. Just mm -hmm. evaporated. The theory of, of, of uniting Parkinson's is the theory of obesity. And I've demonstrated it in my own body. This theory, this philosophical theory I have, obesity is basically like a Parkinsonism because you lose movement. It's not the pain, it's not the, it's, it's not the akinesia, but you start to, you're carrying around 50 extra pounds. Mm -hmm. Your activity, it's, it's a different sort of immobility, but it is an immobility. So back coming to the universals of this, yeah. right? Um, Parkinson's people all over whole are very fit. They're, they're very lean, tiny people. So it's basically the same physiological mechanism. Just it goes differently based on body tops, based yeah. on surroundings, based on, again, family, you know, how well you're supported, whether you, you have to eat your feelings or whether you go out and achieve in the world in your feelings. Parkinson's people are extremely intelligent, highly driven people. This is what kills them some, you know, many, many cultures in Jamaica, you get the PD, you start, all right, I'll take it easy. It's, it's that the Parkinson's people can't take it easy. The taking it easy is literally a message for rest from the body. Mm. What the afferent efferent messages in both cases are being constrained. 
in both the trigger point sense in the fascia, but also in this brand new concept called the biofield. I don't know if you've heard anything about biofield theory. Oh, no. So, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to do like yeah. an aura. Okay. Okay. Like, like the chakras. So we've, how many thousands of years of, of research do we have on Indian medicine? Yeah. Well, we don't use it in Western medicine, but it's legit. Yeah. They, there's still people on the Indian subcontinent. They didn't extinct themselves believing in the chakras, right? As a philosopher, when I start to say this, I bust people's myths. I don't get them in there like, oh, I can't listen to that. I can go, they're all still over there existing. They didn't. I mean, we are trying to use things like Ayurvedic medicine and stuff like that over here. So lots of people have been tapping into, into that. So, you know, this is again where your, you know, base in the UK is slightly different than mine in America, but also very similar. I mean, the trends are up. When people have disposable income, they go to alternate, we call them alternate and complementary medicines. We call it CAM. But again, the Ayurvedic, there's truth there. We just don't have the theory in Western medicine. Nor do we have the financial incentive. Western medicine costs this much and natural, you know, more ancient traditions cost this much. So there's, there's a real tension there. Do you think some of that tension also arises because of, like you say, because of the cost of so the financial, you know, the people that are supporting it, there's different incentives for what should be up here and what's down that, here. That is the precise thing that, again, I feel like as this person who's gotten this knowledge, all I'm doing is kind of synthesizing things. Mm. Philosophically, I'm using my power to think, to do hypotheses. In our current society, we want scientists to just be bench scientists, like doing like research, but that's not the fun of science. I mean, it's necessary, the, the reproducibility, the repetition, I mean, that's how you codify a treatment for the population. But right now we're codifying treatments. We've got all these drugs in development for Parkinson's and we haven't spent any time really going, well, what's the unifying theory of this? So it's, it's just madness. It's, it's utter madness. I and mean, then Parkinson's is just a poster child for, um, again, because Parkinson's people are high driven. They go out and they scour the internet and they have got all of this data coming at them. And they're all really, you know, my, my business partner has a PhD in mass. So he's churning the numbers. And that's why he got locked in and put in a care home. And I succeeded in figuring out how to lose all the weight such that I can unite the globe, that I can be doing this, I can be talking with you and saying, I'm gonna put this on YouTube because this is not going to hundreds of thousands of people, but it might reach three people that either you or I say, listen to this discussion, listen, listen to these theories about mm -hmm. this so that we can get an expert who's in the industry, who's doing the medical research to just be able to see it differently because of how I've described it. You know, again, I have no financial incentive in one, one thing coming out, another, but I really believe phys how I lost the weight was massage therapists. Right. I did not change what I eat at all, in the, in the very least. What actually initiated the fact that I could lose, as a 50-year-old woman, postmenopausal. I mean, that's the other key. Like, you know, people have started thinking that I'm much younger than I am, because it's a fountain of youth. The fascia and the biofield are two, they're, they're united. They're the transmission, the afferent, efferent, everything is basically a circuit between our body and our brain. Everything's a circuit. And they do obviously travel through our nerves. That's the CNS. But the CNS is also electrical. So when you take heart math, yeah. when you take the fact that we know that brain waves are, work at certain frequencies, like 24 hertz, our brains have electrosmog because those waves, they go through like, like water through a, a pipe through our nerves, but like what, because it's going so fast, right? There's a lot, it's like Niagara Falls, right? There, there's all this, you know, fog and mist being generated just by how fast the transmission of our brain is. You see how I'm sort of actually acting this out for you. Hmm. This is a skill that I've developed. This is why I want to be on video. Because I started realizing people were starting to say, it's like, I, I couldn't understand. You went a little too fast for my brain. But then I saw you making the biofield. And I'm going, of course, they're going both and. The placebo effect is the biofield. The placebo effect is, is, 
the, the, the power of electricity to change all of the way, you know, your body stops doing habits. Placebo yeah. effect, you, 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 I don't, you know, EFT, some of the tapping. Okay. So essentially it's, it's, it's actually not this, this particular sequence of tapping. The way I lost all this weight was tapping on my fat, was mm. tapping on my belly. But again, I used to be a person who would not want to draw any attention to my belly, but it's, then when you become, when you understand how human bodies work, fat people start touching themselves. Mm. In the very place, the body forgets about it. So in the physiotherapy sense, if everything's just fine, if you're operating well, that's, that's just, it's just, it's just your storage, you know, it's offsite storage, like your storage locker. It's perfect human nutrition, but if you're not paying attention to it, you're not utilizing it, it's there. Mm. And it starts to become a dead weight because it is supposed to be biologically active. So, you know, the difference between, um, and we would say young and old, but I think that this is really about being bioelectrically coherent is the people who have all that skin is they're just drew, they're, they're, they have no firmness. And then there are some really sexy traditionally built women, mm. especially in Africa, those bodies seem to function at the very same, you know, 250 pounds, an American 250 pounds is significantly less attractive than an African 250 pounds. Is this not, this body, this, this, I, because I love bodies, right? This, this is a very anti-racist sort of statement to be able to draw comparisons between white and brown bodies in a loving way because there has to be some science there there has to be a hypothesis it's it's we're carrying the same biology it's just a surface characteristic about the sun so what does it's not it's not the color of our skin that determines whether or not we are like icky looking fat or we are toned looking fat mm. that is the fascia the fascia is the key because the fascia is the conductivity medium mm. of the afferent efferent CNS messages. We just consider the CNS as the nerves, yeah. but the nerves get constrained trigger points when the fascia is not optimally electrified. Mm. The, the medium becomes dense. So this is obesity is the great thing that you lose capacity really slowly because it's, it's, you know, overeating one meal by another meal that you're storing those calories in, it is so subtle. So, you know, a thin person like you, how did she get to be 333 pounds? But there was never like, like I didn't wake up a Tuesday and be like, I just put on another pound. It's so subtly slow that you really can't under, you don't feel it this, as the person who is happening to. You wake up one day and, you know, and you're like, well, I don't want to put those zipping pants on. I'll put on something comfy cozy. And then you get used to the comfy. It, it's just, you're so busy being a worker that, that, again, when we were more natural people, those signals, we'd have time to think about them, deal with them. Mm -hmm. In our modern world, it's like, just buy another pair of pants off Amazon. Yeah. We, 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 we keep so solving the symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. The symptoms. Is just yeah, like and I think there's, that, it's, there's all that work, isn't there, by like Eckhart Tolle, which talks about this. So we don't, we don't invest necessarily in the root cause of, of our conditions. Yeah. We spend lots of money on treating stuff once we already have the problem. And mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my time, I mean, my specialism is not within like Parkinson's or neurological health, it's musculoskeletal health, which yes. does involve neurology. Yes. Um, generally has what is more the relatively fit person who comes into clinic having had, you know, back pain, neck pain, knee pain, um, whatever it might be. And I would say 90% of the time I talk to them about fascia and that the connectivity of that tissue. Uh-huh. Um, often when they come to me and I say this again all the time that most people don't come to me just about a musculoskeletal issue. There are often um, emotional connections to the problems that they've been having in terms of the longevity of that problem. Doesn't mean to say that they haven't had a mechanical injury. They may have had a slip, a trip, a fall, a catastrophic injury that they have broken a bone, yeah. but there's often other things that are tied up in their issues. Um, so, you know, and I, I would say that one of my unique selling points is being able to have 
these conversations at a depth of level with my patients to ulti ultimately to find out you know what else is going on yes you sprained your ankle and when you sprained it how long ago was that okay but what if, what's happened to you since yeah. how have you managed that why do you think it's not been recovering what positions have you put yourself in that may have compromised that recovery have you gone over on it again so just kind of exploring stuff that then makes them go you know oh yeah actually i have did have a massive fall three months ago on top of that injury that i had six years ago on top of that you know so I do talk to them about, talk to my patients about fascia and try to help get them to understand that it's living, breathing tissue. And when we sing that rhyme, you know, the hip bones connected to the, yeah, the thing that's connecting all of this is your fascia. And um, my description about fascia, I mean, I don't really talk about field so much, is, but it's much more about the use of cling film. Mm -hmm. Cling film. You know, the first time you use that cling film to wrap your sandwiches, it goes round and it's nice and smooth and it's easy to use and manipulate. Yep. But if you try to reuse that cling film, it's scrunchy, it's bunchy, but it, you can still use it. It's still got use, but now you have to handle it in a slightly different way to get the stretchability from the tissues that you're looking for. You know? I am honored to know you. I mean, the way this discussion is going, I knew you know, impromptu. We, we had not arranged people. This was, we, we probably both thought this was going to be more about our businesses, but I'll, I'll circle that back around because health is your business. And kind of what I think we're doing right here, right now is giving you a model because you can only, if you're working that deeply in understanding your patients, you're limited to how many hours a day, how many patients, where if you and I, I give you this idea or you and I have some more discussions about certain overall illnesses and what that means musculoskeletally with the fascia with me and my sort of embodiment like pulling out the philosophy of it this is something that could be sold this is this is for 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 because it's not going to cost us much just the the time to have these conversations we won't edit it we won't make it say this is a detailed and kind of look at it as a case study because again we can we can when we were doing this to first people to pay for it we'd bring out some case studies and you know, I'd be the guinea pig. I'd, I'd be the one who'd be vulnerable and say all of the truth and be, you know, pull me through. Well, what was that emotional thing that would have caused 200 extra pounds on your body? You know, I have that vulnerability. It's part of what Paul has enabled in me because there's so much trust in his community that I've sort of, you know, have this ability to not really be worried about what the outcome is. And I think that that is, again, happening for all of us. You know, you've said that in our direct messages that he's, he's really like just Pied piper in really smart and really mm. caring people. So it's like his tribe are both. They're, mm. they're really talented 10th, to use a loaded terminology in the America, but it's, it's actually true evolutionarily but it's we like, also, sorry there's, sorry there's a there's a thing about people like paul i think that you have to be in a space where you're ready to hear the message mm -hmm. because i would have told you before lockdown i didn't know who paul was he was of no interest to me um you know the matchmaker staff or even his work with oprah winfrey i wasn't aware of it you know, and I will still tell you now that although, you know, I absolutely love Oprah, and I will tell you that if I say Oprah to some people in the UK, it's like, who? Hey? Like, what do you mean you don't know? Oprah? Like, everybody knows Oprah. Yeah. You know? Like, everyone on every, like, to me, part of the planet knows who she is. But I think that these people, people like Paul, who have this ability to capture thousands at a time, you know, putting on, you know, live videos at a certain time, two or three times a week and having 4,000 people show up in a pop, the people that are acknowledging this, they are in a space where they want to hear his message. They're ready to hear that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it wouldn't matter whether he was a pipe, pipe, pipe piper for the 4,000. There'll be another 4,000 that aren't ready to hear the message. Uh -huh. They're not ready to go on that journey. They're not ready to explore or hear or, um, they might listen to one video you know i've shared his videos with people and i'll say you know with my ultimate excitement did you hear what he had to say what did you think and they'll say oh i didn't get around to i haven't listened to it or i started and it just didn't really at the time 
it hasn't held them in the same way that it held me. And maybe because they weren't ready to hear the message that he was ready to give. And you know, I like what you're saying. Let's say I 100% agree, but I think there's an even more important way to look at that. They're in fear. You can't sit and process at that intellectual level and enjoy all of the, you know, meeting the people, like the fun aspects of it. You, if you're in fear, so if, you know, you're just worried that your boss is about to call you up and tell you that you're going to be redundant, you can't be in that. See, we, we, in, in, in how you described it, and which is our cultural soup, right? As far as like internet enabled countries. So it's no longer US, UK, in this sort of internet enabled world, we're all being bullied by the life coach culture. Now I respect the life coach culture a lot, but the thing is, is it became a place where just friends would be life coaching each other in like every discussion. That turned poisonous because friends, you know, who just read a meme about life from a life coach can't really do the deep work. And when you're at the surface level, it causes so much trauma. Mm, It's very disruptive. You know, because, because, In this viral world, when the tallies start happening in two or three years, what we're going to find out is that five times as many people will have died committing suicide from financial stress as the virus. So it's the mismanagement of mankind here. The virus is a big, I mean, the virus is the most successful threat. We know that it's real, yeah. It's the most successful threat that humanity's ever faced, but when how we're dealing with it right now is as all of these categorizations as a divided species mm. is going to that's going to kill more people. So there's a real obligation now when competent professionals like you and I, because I'm going to reflect back to you that what you just said about Paul, Paul's model should be your model too. Now you're going to stay in, you know direct personal practice. But if you would start to once a week or twice a week, once a month, just to get started, put in your mind, I'm gonna pull together a case study, or I'm gonna pull together the top, you know, for some reason I saw now that Parkinson's has come up, it's gonna, you know, you will have somehow, some way that will be in your signal. And you just wanna talk as a physiologist about, it's not the repet. The problem is they're getting exercise, but they're doing the repetitive model. They're getting on a treadmill. And we know that it's the actual the creativity, the singing and some of the dancing. With Parkinson's, because it's neurological as well, you don't want to lean into the body pain. You don't want to build muscle. You don't want to keep do the repetitive stuff. You want creativity. You, they need to be doing improv kind of dancing. You know, mm. down at a low tempo, there's balance issues. But we're so used to wanting to count repetitions. We're so used to wanting to time clock. I've been on the treadmill for 20 minutes. But the neurological dysfunction is really, again, just it just is dying down slowly, slowly, slowly. And then the repetitive cycle. So now the person starts hunching over like a euro symbol. When that person's body starts taking that symbol for a euro, which is we know that's the Parkinson's posture. And I love that I imagined it looking like a euro and I demonstrated it because it's the real key. Because what I'm going to tell you is come back to your spine. What has happened to our spine, which is the, how the quickness, the efficiency of our brain, afferent and efferent message is body and brain, the spine needs to be erect. Every tiny little millimeter that your spine is not erect, it's not seated correctly you are actually constraining the bandwidth of the spinal cord. Now, not all the way to injury disease, but every little bit takes down the, this is the difference between somebody like Paul, somebody like myself right now, just dialed in. Just just what's coming out of our mouths as we know that we're being recorded is spot on. We're not struggling over our words. We're not losing our train of thought. That's not how most modern humans are functioning. Most modern humans, again, looking at the 45 guy, losing trains of thought, stumbling over things. It's, it's, they're a mess of emotions and stress and all of the, stopping them. It's, it's, this is why humanity is not responding well to the crisis. Some of us, this especially tribe PCB, we're evolving. We, we have the physical mental fitness baseline to be able to adapt quickly. 
we're doing what humans are created to do and we're like okay you know there's a there's a horrible reality transpiring out there but some of us those of us with this capability we've got to be here for when it's time to like rebuild reinvent we're not on the front lines we're not medical professionals those of us who are internet enabled professionals have to start teaching the globe to think about operating their own body because if you are not mentally and physically fit both how are you going to deal with this transformation because of COVID-19? I, I think that there is, um, I, a big part of me feels that those of us that are in the position and need to pivot are already people that were pivoting before COVID. We, 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 we suffered. Had. We yeah. were already, we all, there was already a need to be flexible there was already a need to be adaptable. When I look at what my business has been doing in the last five years, you know, how it started mm -hmm. to where it is at now, I would say I'm going to, and I've been very honest about this, and I've said this in talks I've done before, I think that my business changes every six months. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say necessarily, you know, how I'm practicing or what I do from a skill level is any different. The business entity. The business That's entity. The key evolving. Uh, and and it's evolving in terms of how I access my my patients, how they access me, yeah. how I market myself to them. When I realise that I'm attracting a certain type of patient and what their needs are, mm -hmm. and I, when it was at the very start, and it was like you know, oh, you're not entitled to anything, so you've got to pivot your business and you need to make this money each month. I was becoming, I'm, you know, in my mind, the um, Oprah Winfrey in healthcare. So I was doing lives on Instagram with different professionals. I wasn't talking about physiotherapy. In fact, that wasn't what was important. My patients wanted to know what was the right thing to eat at the moment. Yes. How should they train? Because training was different. They weren't at the gym anymore. Mm -hmm. How was that change in training going to impact their current knee pain, back pain, post-surgery mm -hmm. they wanted to know um constructively how i intended to manage them and i started off bringing on personal trainers because they are massive on the social media platforms at the moment and that's everyone and when i talk about personal trainers i'm including in that yoga meditation where people are personally guiding you to do yes. something to improve your mental physical emotional well-being and I started to bring people on to talk about these things. I've said this and I, you know, I say it repeatedly in and amongst all of this COVID, we are being told about lockdown and we are being instructed on lockdown in terms of stay at home, go outside once a day. Now that's been extended in the UK. But what we're not being told is how to look after our immune systems in this time. And those of us that we have, that have been told who are ill and have got the cancers and have very poor immune systems and have been asked to stay inside for 16 weeks, what I'm understanding that those people are at risk. But what are we saying to them? Tell, it's like, you know, um, there's two parts to every saying, curiosity killed the cat. But the other half of that is that satisfaction brought it back. Mm -hmm. Bring me back. Tell me the other half of my story, you know? So... Yes, I will stay at home because I understand that's the safest place for me. We already know that um, whether it's internet wide as a world or otherwise, that most of us were not eating well. So obesity is a problem. We know that diabetes is a problem. We know that hypertension is a problem. So why in this pandemic have we not got more adverts that talk about don't forget to drink your two or three liters of water? Why is there not enough emphasis on the physios who may be able to provide exercise management and exercise therapy for their patients? Why is there not the push on this? And I'm struggling to understand that. It's like we're not being told the full story. And I'm not going to go into um, being, um, not talking about conspiracy theories. I'm talking about logic here. Logic. This is simple logic, and I'm not confusing that with emotion. This is pure logic. We have a virus that we know is 
that people who have immunosuppressant conditions or who are vulnerable will be susceptible to it and it will attack their immune systems. You as the government need to tell me, what should I do? What could I do? It's, is, it, is, it, is my five a day still enough? Or should I increase well, in times my, of um, times of immense stress and it advertise it to me. advertise it to feed me with instead what we're being fed is yes, we need our key workers and we know that, but the adverts have been uh, reshaped to talk about a key worker. We've got the adverts that are talking about charities and contributing to charities and clean water and this kind of stuff. And in my head I'm going, okay, so these companies from a media point of view are reevaluating themselves and evolving. Mm -hmm. But what's the benefit to each individual human? How does, how does that benefit us right now? So whether this is Parkinson's right now, whether this is obesity right now, whether this is a broken leg right now, the information should be constantly, they say if you see something seven times, you will remember it or you will tap into it show me seven times every day for the child who's watching tv because the parent can't homeschool for the people who perfect can't point work. perfect point bang it out to me that mum i need some fresh fruit and veg and when we're those of us that are contributing to food banks what are we contributing to the food banks and is that is that good is that wholesome food and even if it's not fresh and it's tinned what is it how can they make the most of it so actually the, the pivot should be everywhere, not everywhere. just for everywhere. those of us entrepreneurs or business business related. The whole world should be people give, should be pivoting. Those that can give us constant information, i.e., the people who handle TV, mm -hmm. everything that comes out. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have other shows or you know to entertain us. I'm not saying that, but give me in there. Talk to me about my fruit. Talk to me about my veg. Talk to me about my immune system. Talk to me about the things that can ultimately help me to improve the condition of my life in lockdown because right. 16 weeks of staying inside your home if you're someone with a, a low immune system already i've not got any stronger no mm -mm. i'm not i'm not any stronger i'm not any stronger and i still might need physiotherapy and i still might need to go to my gp appointment but i'm not any stronger in fact now i'm i'm even more frightened than i was ever before Exactly. It's, it's the, it's the emotionality is it's, it's again, you know, we had the whole growth and fixed mindset. I think we have to have a third. It's the evolving mindset is yeah. you, you've got to be homeodynamically going all this stuff and we're skipping right past basic education. Again, in America, I can guarantee you people don't know what a virus is. They don't know that it's not alive. I see people in their own cars wearing their masks, panting, right? Because <laughs> this is the problem with the summer. It's going to get hot. The masks are going to become uncomfortable. You're not really going to be, it's in, I went to my farmer's market yesterday. I'm on an island. I'm on a very low pop population. I'm not even on the continental U.S. Yeah. At this farmer's market, they had to have three to four more employ times more employees than customers. The, you know, the employees are ordering the customers around now. You have to go in a certain way. You don't just go shop at a farmer. You, you have to follow. You go around the field and, you, you know, they, they had signs. You can't come in without a mask. So I had to say I'm chemically sensitive. I have a respiratory situation. I cannot block my airflow because it creates an intense, like, feeling of panic for me. How, how am I going to be able to reintegrate in the world now? If, if masks are required, just think, and nobody even knows what they're doing. They're not doing what anyone thinks they're doing. And you and I just have to keep doing this. I think that there is a real nugget here of just, you know, when we can find a conversation and we put it out there and then we are sharing it directly with our clients because it's about logic. You have got to be mentally fit. You have to be asking the right questions. No one's going to help you out right now. And so there's so much just chaos and so many people are just trying to get back to normal. You know, when, when 80 to 90% of every, all of the human energy is packed into getting back to a normal that clearly doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Precedent has left earth. Precedent has left earth. Yeah. If you find yourself in your brain going, it used to work like this, doesn't work like you, you, you know, you need to, to do some movement. You need to go, okay, it doesn't work like this anymore because we're not going to keep taking oil out of the earth anymore. We've, we've got all, cars are basically going to stop being manufactured. 
not like not like a debt like not like a but but elon musk is throwing hissy fits Elon Musk of the electric car fame and Mars City fames is throwing hissy fits. He's basically told Gavin Newsom he's taking his toys away from California, where he's got factories because of the factory workers. So not yet again about the intellectual property engineer workers. He's pissed that his factory workers can't go back and make more cars. Mm. But he's really not. Because Elon is a smart, and I don't like him. He's not personality-wise my kind of tea. But I see the strategic mind. The hissy fit he's throwing is he's realized cars will not continue to exist in all of his projections. The projections he's made about how much money, how to, how to keep all these people employed, in my case. How do he keep all his fact, because nobody's going to be buying cars at the volume that he did in his projections. And he, he's, he's, he's realizing this on a gut level, that because his fortune is in a, a technology that's just become extinct. I think that um, when you when you look at what this, yeah. so I, I have a private members Facebook group called I Am a Private Physio. It's only about thirty five people strong, right? Yeah. And um, I started it because I found I was being asked a lot of the time, you know, can you help me with this complex patient? Um, I just want to ask you this. I just want to ask you constantly ask. I, I you know what? If I set up the group. You can put, you can drop it in there and then I don't have to be the only one who has to get back to you before the end of the day, right? Right. And steadily this, you know, little tribe, if you like, started to grow. And today, because we had the Boris conversation yesterday, Boris Johnson, you know, our prime minister, people then started to contact me directly. So they forget the group, come back to me again. What do I think? Mm -hmm. Is my clinic open? How do I feel about it? Have I got PPE? How much am I charging? Da, 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 da. Yeah. My, patients, my patients are pressuring me to return. To, and it goes on and on and on. And I normally, my normal thing, I'm going to say normal. I'm not going to say pre-COVID, but my usual response is normally to be quite reactive. So, you know, they ask me a question and my response, bam. They ask me another question, my response, bam. And I guess that's why people always come and ask me. Right, they get, they get value right away, efficiently. Right away, right away. And actually then I thought, for a long time I've been, you know, probably over the last couple of years, hold on a minute, I don't need to answer that straight away because maybe I don't know. Maybe I need time to think about it. Maybe I need time to evaluate. And actually, I've got other questions that I want answering. And before I answer your question, I might need to find out the answers to my question before I can respond to yours. And what I think has happened, you know, when you're talking about Elon Musk and, and having, you know, he's got something here that he's done projections for. Most of us that have got businesses have done projections. You know, we didn't know, you know, those of us that don't believe in the conspiracy, you know, we didn't know Corona was happening. So we have projected as a result of where we were at, you know, last year and looking at years before and, and trying to make to build that up as our profiles. But I'll never forget. I'm not sure I was listening to it at the time. But the person said to me, whatever your profession is right now, that's what you were. It's not what you are now. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you have severely, significantly, or whatever you want to say, invested in something as a result of what it could do, you know, its potential, because it hasn't done it yet, COVID may well put you in a position where you are unable to be as flexible as you would like. Yeah. And if you are flexible, it may mean that you have to lose your actual investment in order to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And lo lo everyone has lost something as a result You're of all, every, all 7.8 billion. I mean, we need to put yeah. this, this is what I think you'll agree with me that, that the single everyone. problem is it's every country for themselves. In America, we're dead last. I mean, there is no question that America is responding to the virus dead last. I know a microbiologist in Botswana. Balobi is going to become world famous. I've known this guy for five years on LinkedIn. He's an algaepreneur. And I just keep saying he's giving me a reliable, professional first person that only one death, and they're containing it well. They're do because Botswana is a modern democracy. They're, they really have the set up using the diamond wealth to serve their country. They, they, got, they saw all the lessons of how all the rest of us did it so very wrong. 
So, you know, there's, they had to have the heart to do it, but they also used that strategy of, of really seeing everything that went wrong and we need to evolve. We're, yeah. we're not just going to, Botswana is not going to play by the rules. South Africa is already playing by the rules of, you know, the, the, I hate the, the terms, you know, the, the UK and US rules. Mm. And look at, it's still strife, right? And, and they have this great surge with Mandela, but then when it got down to business as usual, governing a country by the numbers, by the economies, South Africa plummeted again, because it all comes down to your citizens first. So Botswana, I've, I've now met a tribe member with, on Paul Carrick Brunson, the photographer, Ron Foster. Turns out we've been to some of the same places in Northern Southern Africa near Botswana. So we're now thinking we might do a documentary. See, edutainment, instead of, again, this is all wrong in America, the more we focus on what's wrong, we're not inventing what's right. We can start talking about Botswana globally. What is this country in, in South Africa, the Southern African region done mm -hmm. that is, they're, they're right on pace with New Zealand. And I know my pale people have no concept, right? This is, this is me trying to take the skills of Paul Carrick Brunson as a TV host. And from, you know, being a philosopher, being a software consultant, having no idea going, I'm creating broadcasts. My mm -hmm. broadcasts are targeted to only just a handful of really smart, really caring people, mm. right? Is how do I get this to the right kinds of people? And how do I work with partners like you? I mean, this is, again, you and I both are kind of seeing, there'll be two or three people we're gonna wanna just say, here's this recording, I'll put it on YouTube, and I'll just send you the URL. And we've, we've created evergreen content. We've now said, if you want a masterclass, with Leanne or Deb, go watch the two of them sort of have a discussion that just keeps evolving and evolving. And it's, it's really, watch us. We're, we're demonstrating, we're modeling how we're doing this for ourselves and our own specialties, but they, they cross and we, we have, you know, all kinds of information about each other's specialties. So the, the conversation just evolves. And yeah, what, how are we on time? I've, I've got, I had an extra 30 minutes, but how's your time? Yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. I think there's, um, what, what I've noticed, because, you know, one of the big, big things, and I, this probably comes back, or maybe it does, or maybe it doesn't, comes back to some of the Elon Musk stuff. It will. People's, people's um, struggle with lockdown, or even with the virus itself, is this whole thing about not being able to control like their anxiety or their stress, right? Mm -hmm. And does that come down to, you know, financial concerns, physical health and well-being? can't manage at home. I'm in a relationship that I don't want to be in. I've got kids and I can't school them. You know, actually life was just about normal before. And now this has made it collapse. Yes. Collapse. Mm -hmm. Right, and some people are trying to build, rebuild brick by brick without being able to take a break. So if I decide that I've put a plan in place to achieve something, I can work on it a little bit today and then I can leave it, right? I can go away from it for three or four days, a week, a month, a year if I want, and then I come back and I start to work on it again, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Actually, what people are being made to do right now is work on everything fast. Because we don't know exactly when we're going to come out of lockdown. Right. But when, when you do come out of it, you're going, do I want to take all the parts of normal, what was normal before? Am I going right back to that? Is that healthy for me? You've got parents that are saying, do I really want to take my children back to homeschooling? Exactly. I, you know, we've got at the moment clothing companies who are saying there's 50% off the entire website. Why bother? I'm in the same tracksuit trainers, tracksuit and hoodie and that I was in yesterday. Like I actually acknowledge that maybe I'm not going to be going clubbing. I'm not going to be go do I how much of my summer wardrobe do I need? Like when am I gonna wear that bikini? I don't live by the beach. So do you know? We've and been created we're 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 not human beings, we're human mm -hmm. consumers. Yeah. Is it's just that whole cycle yeah. and it, it's amazing. And even I mean, we are clearly incredibly intelligent women. But you get caught up in it. It becomes this this addiction. And, that... way of life. and I've said I've said all the time, even before any of this. And you know, I wonder if 
if my patients were to like watch this, whether they'd be like, Leanne, I, you know, did I know that you felt like this? Or did you always think like this? I've always felt like this. I say constantly that our world has been designed for us to, to spend money on a continuous basis, right? right? right. Um, so December, you have Christmas. January is the new year. And even though you're probably broke from Christmas, there's some way for you to spend the money. Well, it's February. Valentine's Day, the whole, the, I mean, so it's all the is, money and the love thing together. February is Valentine's. March, maybe it's Mother's Day. April is Easter. May, and we go on like this, May, VE Day. We go on every month and then throw in one or two relatives' birthdays, a wedding, a christening, a funeral or whatever. You have spent, on, you've done your whole budget, but the budget almost needs to make sure it accounts for some kind of occasion each month. Yes. That may well cost you a substantial amount. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, things like that, I've had my birthday in lockdown. Was it important for me to get any gifts? Of course it wasn't. Did my, I, I've never made that a big thing anyway, just because that's the nature of me. Mm -hmm. But for those people who would ordinarily, I like to go out and meet my friends, most definitely. But presents, did it matter? Actually, for those of us that are in lockdown right now, on your birthday, you just want to see your family. You want to have a meal with them. You want to be able to hug them. It's no longer about what you can consume right. to be able to celebrate that occasion. It actually doesn't matter anymore companies are going to fail. Like companies that thought that, that they had this broad base. So Disney, well, I like to go big. Disney is in a lot more trouble. I mean, it's like one of the most well-capitalized companies. We're all like, how can Disney be, be one of the yeah. main signals? And I'll tell you what it is, is their empire is built on individuals who are safe and secure. You don't go to an amusement park if you are financially, if you can't feed your kids, you don't consume all this la di da entertainment. They, they misrepresented the, their, their audience. Because when things are good and when you know, the, there's all this, you know, the government, everyone's telling you it's all great, you'll consume these things mindlessly. To the point that there was actually such a segment of society who used Disney, Disney films and amusement parks to zone out. We're all now having to come to terms with, there's no zoning out time. Zone out. Your, your brain has to be on now. This is, this is survival mode. This is literally adaption of the fittest. And again, you know, you're, you're saying the positive in information about keeping physically fit. I mean, it's horrible. But I'm saying not a single person is talking about how much mental fitness it is taking to, to homeschool your kids. To, you have to literally be clear enough. And this is, I think, really about physical wellness. Mm -hmm. to say, I make decisions today. I make life-centric decisions. So this is sort of, you know, my brand now is to keep using the phrase life-centric. Right. Keep a human alive. Don't, don't worry about what's going to happen if you're, if you're an executive at Disney. Keep your family alive because Disney might just, you might be getting an email in three weeks mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. there's no more Disney. It really is going to happen this summer. That yeah. companies that we believe are just as robust as could be. This is why you're not hearing anything from Macintosh. Apple is not, there's Google is not saying, there's no signals coming out of these corporations because they know they're inside. They don't have time to be fighting, to be making any predictions. So in the US, Amazon a long time ago said, nobody come back to downtown Seattle until October. What's happening now is Google and Facebook are saying, nobody's coming into the office in 2020. The, we, we're going away from sort of who had money and who this. We're going to have a two-class world. Who has internet access and who does not? Yeah. Who can earn the living online? So again, back to Paul, about to the value that he is creating for those of us who are now able to follow his lead and make these communities that we're having now, that you and I now have a piece of Evergreen content. And if we never collaborate again together, like this, this, this is a high ticket value is we will both be getting somebody willing to spend, you know, five or six figures to work with us because we'll know that person and we'll send them to this research. We'll say, yeah, if you, I, who's going to have time to call and have testimonials and all. It's like, this is it. You spend this time watching me have this discussion. You'll know what the value that we both offer. Yeah. In, in different countries and separate values, we both demonstrate it is completely impromptu. See, this is the evolving aspect of it. The people yeah. who have to check their notes, the people who are preparing, the, 
they're not going, they're, they're, they're simply not going to be able to keep up. Yeah. You've got every single day is a brand new set of questions. You get more data from the internet. If you're just looking for the signals about fear, 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 you're in jeopardy. When you're looking for the signals about, okay, now in America, most tech companies, the tech companies who intend to be here a long time, yeah. they're, 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 and it's a two, it's, 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 it's either or. If you are a knowledge worker, they want you safe at home, not a chance of a cough. If you're a warehouse worker, a first responder, a nurse, you know, these people are putting their lives on the line and they're not the primary focus of anyone, anywhere, really. I mean, we're, we're getting all of the thank yous, like they're flying drones, they're turning on hotel lights, but mm. actually, doing things to pivot the work environment in hospitals, to, to, to redeploy people, all of this unemployment. We need these people being greeters at hospitals. We need people out on the streets, like in New York City, learning how to triage people, have people come in a side door, right? So this person's really sick, you go in the emergency room. This person knows that they were exposed to somebody really sick. We send them back the, around the back way. These, you and I, again, the, the amount of value, if we could get strategically to decision makers in hospitals, look at, look at, we can, because I see you, you're going at precisely. And we, why we're precisely, what's upsetting us, is we know that it takes this kind of perspective. You, they need the perspective of the neighbor in the high rise next door, seeing, seeing that the conditions of getting into the hospital are creating the spread of the virus. When you're in the hospital fighting the virus, you don't see how bad the conditions are just to get in the hospital. It's that neighbor next door who has no real idea how to solve it, really. But they're like, but there's all, you know, nobody's back there where you bring the linens in. You know, the linen delivery back in the back way. I think that one of the um, things for me was that, so I work in the private setting as a physio and not in the NHS. And the calls that I started to get originally um, were very much about people, you know, like I've been discharged from hospital, I have no protocol. I had a total hip replacement, total knee replacement. You know, the health is poor. And because these people had literally like been like evacuated, if you like, they, they were left out on a, on a limb. And some people, and I know this will be happening to them now, is they still won't be walking properly. They still won't know what they can and can't do. They may have been people who were at risk. So they got home deliveries happening instead of them going out to the supermarket and the supermarket being their first trip post-op. Their review appointments in the hospital have been canceled. Right. And if it's been able to see, speak to somebody, it's been only online and then they feel like they can't fully explain themselves, time's only short. And I was frustrated that those of us like myself who were in private healthcare, we basically, it was like I was pivoting and then suddenly it was like, no, you know? And I was like, well, we do come under private health. We, sorry, we do come under healthcare. And we should have been, I think, as part of the, the key workers that were provided with, if it was gloves, gowns, masks, whatever it was, to enable us to keep going, which would, without a shadow of a doubt, taking the pressure off of our healthcare service. Yeah. You know, if you know that you, are, you live in an area and when you're being discharged, the hospital knows that they can refer to you, you know, privately. We're not telling you that Leanne is the best, but we're telling you she's offering a service. Yep. And this is somewhere that they could, they know I'm, you know, HCPC registered, for example, Healthcare and Professionals Council registered. They know that I'm registered with the Charter Society of Physiotherapy. I, you know, I've got my professional indemnity. They at least know that you've got the right credentials yep. to provide the service, even, even if it's basic, to assist their patients my biggest my biggest concerns have been about those patients post-op poor recovery not being able to witness if they've had infection deep vein thrombosis because people are not just dying of covid people are still dying of, of ordinary you know other diseases so, so this is again you know if if no. anybody had any more people foresight still, yeah people are still dying of other things and then to um 
I forgot my other point, but Sorry. that was definitely one of my main concerns. Um, and, and people just not having the access to that information. Who do I call? I don't know who to call, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so, you know, it's very interesting. I think we've got a good partnership because, you know, I'm a philosopher and a software mm -hmm. consultant. So you're, you're talking about triaging all of the, you know, medical work. And again, you know, I'm following some guy on Twitter who's on dialysis. I mean, his life used to be a living hell. Now it's a living like hell squared. You know, he's got to, I mean, it's like a battle for him to get there. So we've, we've got this society full of chronic disease. And we need literally everyone who's, who's anywhere near competent to be directing people to how to help themselves. So when I was the co-founder of OutThinkingParkinson's.com, based in the UK, my partner, Young Unset Parkinson's, what we called it was quality of life interventions. We didn't, we, we, we were, you know, he's a math, so I'm a philosopher. But there's this big thing about education. If you can think about your health logically, those of us who are not in the medical system right now, it is our civic global duty to not get ill, to not let being locked down make us mentally ill, make us do, choose, to choose poor diets. But even more importantly, I stumble there because the most important thing is getting our sleep. Those of us who are well must prioritize. It's, it's anti what every other message is gonna be. Everyone else is staying up all night, streaming Netflix, typing on the, you know, getting their anger out on Twitter. It's a great place to do that. You know, mm -hmm. just, just, just tweet about something, boom, you felt that emotion. I mean, it's sort of what it's there for. We, we, mm -hmm. we all say that that's kind of negative, but when done appropriately, you mm -hmm. know, you, you find out how, how Boris Johnson screwed up, you find out how 45 screwed up, you spend 30 seconds, you tweet out, and then you're present to your family. Whereas if you yeah. hadn't gotten that out about how our leaders are failing us, spectacularly, mm -hmm. we, we, we're not leading the globe anymore. It, any level either country for separate reasons that are entirely the same so so that brings me sorry to interrupt you you go and uh, but the that brings me onto what i was couldn't think about before as to one of my concerns if you notice no one has spoken about correct me if i'm wrong because i'm not i'm not on the news all the time I'm not watching the news all the time that's for my own mental health me too right but what they haven't spoken about is conditions like, just as an example, ME, chronic fatigue, um, all these kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. That they already don't know the full etiology of them, you know, how they start. They always come back to, it was possible that you had a virus. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 that theory is right there and you get the conspiracy theory it's people, but it's that very- you had a virus, right? Now, what we're now, what we now have is this coronavirus. We've known we've got, had, there's, lo there's been strains of coronavirus before, so we've not, it's not like, oh my God, we've never ever had this. You're right. But what we don't know is how does this, hand, how, if you are someone who gets the coronavirus, mm -hmm. are you someone who recovers but doesn't recover fully? And what, and what does not recovering fully look like in that person? Precisely. So does it present as, ME? Does it present as chronic fatigue? Does it present as, you know, what does, what does it look Parkinson's like? Parkinson's or obesity. It's all the Parkinson's same thing. And I'll, I'll explain right. it. So what it is, is that our body can only, it only, there's only so much energy. So if you have an intense signal like a virus, in my case, it was actually a mold exposure. The mm -hmm. reason I became so ill and, and nearly lost my life through evaporation was a mold exposure. What happens when your body goes through one of those intense events, we see it with PSTD. So if you've been raped, if you've watched somebody be murdered, your health, there's just, your health is gone. You, until you get support to process that, your health is gone. Well, a viral infection is the same thing. We just don't talk about it. We're, we're not embodied enough to see the raging changes. Your body will do everything. It's, it's like literally fight or flight or freeze, but just in the immune system, in the symptomology, in the sore throat. So again, the intensity of this virus is novel. So this is both an important thing and a bad thing and a good thing. Because it's this novel thing, humans like to repeat what they already know. 
So everyone is, is just mostly there's not enough single about signal about how intense the pain is. When you look at the medical reports, and I've been following doctors on Twitter who have yeah. been in the hospital on ventilators. This is not flu. This is not something that makes you miserable and you drink your yeah. juice and you're back to work in a week or two. This is an intensely painful, that's why it's fatal. It's literally collapsing, I believe, the fascia. I think that there is, that it's more mm. than the, the cytokine storm, I think it is actually the communication network. It just can't happen. So then organ after organ goes offline. There's just simply not enough energy capacity because so much metabolic effort is going into the immune function. So the, cyto the cytokine storm is the symptom. It's not, we, if, just if we dialed that down, your body would still need to keep fighting the virus, right? There's still something, the, the mechanism of action, if you want my opinion, and we'll go a little woo-woo here, but I think you're going to be with me, <laughs> is, is vibration. It's, it's keeping your body's harmony, your overall harmony, your overall mental fitness, your, your, your I, I can deal with this, I, I, I can right. interact. I, I think that overall, this is, most, this is most illnesses, most injuries. You know, if I say to my patients, you know, for example, the ones who, you know, my back has just gone, what were you doing when your back just went? And usually it's something really innocuous, like, oh, I was just putting some clothes into the washing machine, for example, yeah. or I was putting something into the oven, or I woke up that morning, I put my feet on the ground and suddenly, bam. Mm -hmm. And then I say, to, so when I hear that, I say, okay, so what else has been happening? Oh, you know, work's been really stressful, or we just had a new baby and, you know, in and out of the yeah. car and all this kind of stuff. And then I know it's not, it's not the innocuous movement that caused that issue. Right. Like, this is collective. This is you know, it's been building, uh -huh. you know, with your new baby, there's the emotion of, of the new baby. Is the baby safe? Has he got everything that you need? How is mum? Blah, 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 blah. You know, if it's, um, you know, it, I'm, I've always been very convinced. And I think that people that know me as a physiotherapist know that the holistic approach to the patient's care has always been key to me. And if you haven't, if you're unable to identify other things going on in somebody else's life. I'm not saying you need to pry to know the depth of that person, but if you, if you don't know what the facets are that lead up to their problem, I don't think that you ultimately get them better in the same way that I think if I understand what's wrong with you physiologically and I try to treat it, but now I don't understand why you don't hold the commitment to the exercises, just as an example. Uh -huh. If I've never managed to get onto your psyche with any of that, you are then a non-compliant patient or exactly. you become a crap physio. And, 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 and it's again, even people who desperately desire to be, you know, the perfect patient, it's, it's, if they haven't changed their environment, then they fall into the patterns that got them in that chronic state to begin with. This is about mental fitness. This is about evolving consciousness as much as anything else right now. Is evolving your thinking finding really intelligent people having the kinds of discussions that now people can go away with this and they've got like five points because we, we, we've covered 25 points but they'll know the ones that they feel that like okay i gotta make sure my posture is correct i think posture again back to saying about being obese and, and there is something about being on the postural standard on the skeletal standard that improves the bandwidth of your afferent efferent spinal cord transmission I don't hear people talking about it. It's so, you know, we see injury is different than disease. All of these categorizations, all of the separation. And I'm gonna say something that's probably, you'll, you'll like that I go there, but everyone else is gonna be, this is taboo. But there's a difference in men and women. The holistic practitioners, and this is not a stereotype, this is not a negative thing, this is a statistical fact. The holistic practitioners are more 80% women. The men are great, 20%, they're good at it. They, but most Western medicine is coming from a masculine perspective. Hmm. We've got this thing wrong with us, let's eradicate it. Let's dial down the symptoms so we can go hustle, hustle, hustle. I don't think that people will, to be honest, I don't think that people will dispute that. I mean even now, you know, you look at orthopedic consultant work, just as an example, and mm -hmm. over here in the UK, I would say that maybe 80% of the consultants are male. Mm -hmm. I don't think, and, and whether they wanted to consider their approach to 
uh, you know, surgery, non-surgery or whatever is masculine or not. It's majority men, you right. know. The consultants that are referring to me for orthopedic care. And again, it doesn't have to be masculine in the sense of a certain particular genital. It's right. socialized. The men but, this, but that's what I'm saying. So yeah. even without it being a man that's doing it, do, right. this, do you know what I'm saying? I do. Uh, the approach to the that. Ethos. The, the ethos and the paradigm, even that our, us women work in, is I very don't think much... I debate that. I don't think, I, I think it would be difficult for them to do so. <laughs> That's my, I, I, I do think that we, we have moved into an, an era where the patient is much more informed. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that level of information, consultants now, they don't take the approach of, let's just operate on you tomorrow. Yeah. No, it is, let's try physiotherapy. And, I, and that has changed, I would say, over the last, I'm going to say eight years to my physio knowledge. I've been a physio now for about 15 years. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But I know that before that, and I started in the system as a physio assistant, right? Mm. So I was young in the system and I saw what happened, you know, come for a certain number of physio, no, or maybe you'd had your surgery and then you came to physio. Well, how come they hadn't tried you with physiotherapy before? Before. Right. So this is what I'm saying from my own memory, memory recollection and me being in my, uh, my late teens, what I was able to see then knowing that I was going to be working in this profession. You know, I've always been that kind of clinician who's really, I'm watching what's happening constantly. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm dyslexic and dyspraxic. Right. So my brain is constantly looking for efficient, effective strategies that work. Nor neurodiverse is actually a survival technique in viral times. Is this is this whole thing? We looked at it as if it was a problem. The reason the trend came up, and again, I, I consider myself having developed adult onset autism, as the mold dialed down my my signals, and the and then the obesity became, you know, less movement, more food, less movement, more food. It's very very subtle, and it start. It's just a pattern. The pattern then becomes the only signal. And you get locked in. I couldn't walk or talk basically now 13, 14 months ago. Okay, I can't keep track of what time is now. I mean, like it feels like I mean the virus has been happening to us for a year, does it not? You know, so this is how time starts morphing when you're in crises. That what's happened is all 7.8 billion humans are in survival mode to some extent or another. Yeah. We are in, you're either fight, flighting or freezing. You're getting information that you don't want to get. You're, you're dealing with death and grief and financial stress. It's again, it's this, when we want to say either or, when we want to find strict causality, this is why Western medicine failed where Eastern medicine didn't. There was a much more, it's going to be these five things. We're going to give you Tai Chi to move. We're going to give you these herbs. We're going to stick some, some acupuncture, which is bioelectricity. We're going to work at you in these five planes. I mean, again, it's the five elements concept, the Ayurveda. These are robust systems of health. If you just take off your paradigm glasses of everything that keeps you from going to your 40 hour week cubicle job is a disease that you want the symptoms gone for. If you come down to, here's how to be robustly healthy in a human body, which is again, more how the Indian and Chinese medicines and African. So part of what I wanna do long-term and now, near term now is to come back and actually tie Africa, healing in Africa, which is singing and dance in community. Mm. Singing and dance in community was the original healthcare. Mm. It was the way to remain vibrant because not only are you getting the physical movement, you're getting your exercise in the singing, you're expressing yourself, you're, you're being creative. You're, and then in community, you're doing the emotional work. If somebody, you know, stole a pumpkin from another place, you dance that out that night. You'd be like, the guy was like, but I'm sorry, but this happened. And I meant to tell you, you just weren't around, right? That's back in the day, these mm. kinds of, of simple things were very humanly dealt with. In our modern society, it's like, I'm going to take you to court or I'm going to call the police. We, we, we just now need all of these systems of intermediaries when we can't talk as real humans. And you and I have demonstrated again and again in this conversation, brilliance, 
the, the capacity to have an intellectual conversation across every divide and to keep the conversation. We're not just sort of sticking on one point. This conversation is evolving. We've brought in, you know, we can bring in basically anything. There's no fear about how our minds are, we, we, we go, okay, yeah, new information. How do I put this into what I know and forward the conversation? So over to you. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise. And the noise means that even for those that have the intelligence or could, um, apply themselves to pivot or whatever mm -hmm. they can't hear because the noise is so loud yeah. and I do think in order for people to be able to um, to turn or to see things differently you need your surroundings to be in a way that allows you to to be emotional for it to be safe for it to be okay yeah. so that support around you is is one thing um as a physio yes we work on the science but it's we know that our work is not purely science it, there's no way that it could be you know a lot of our treatments are you know if you if you look into the body in bodies of our research it's short-term relief for a lot of things that we do mm -hmm. and but yet we have um you know, a part of what we do is very much about long-term management. Well, the only way I can really sustain you long-term is to find out about who you really are. Yes. You know? And the psychology of this comes into what we call as our subjective assessment, where I start to ask you about your problem, your pain, how does it affect you? How does it impact your sleep? But in and amongst all of that, I will ask you about your 40 hour a week job. And I will ask you if you're married and I will ask you how many kids you've got and you bet your bottom dollar because I'm the first person that you've spoken to who really gives a damn. Yes. You now want to tell me a little bit more about your story because my ears are pricked mm -hmm. and you have no idea about how this is going to help your back, neck, knee pain or the problem in your little finger. But because I'm listening and nobody else will, you want to tell me. Yes. You want to tell me. And that act in itself is healing, right? Is, is, is that I, I have already, you already want to come back to me for the next appointment. Yep. Because how many times has somebody asked you how you are and never really cared about it? How many I, times has somebody asked you how you are, but they didn't really want to know the answer? You know? So I think that as our... I'm going to call this COVID as it has evolved, as it has evolved our world, in our world, we are having to make changes that ultimately take us back to what we used to know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily- it's take wisdom. Forward. I mean, it, it, I, I'm not being subtle about it, is mm -hmm. that, you know, the way to unite the globe is to go back and teach us how to be healthy again from the, from the ground up. Yeah. But those of us who aren't yeah. going to get the virus, who don't commit fina financial suicide, those of us who don't end up homeless and unable to, you know, it is our duty as global citizens to learn how to operate human bodies so we don't have this burden of chronic disease, so that we aren't eating and making ourselves less and less able to respond physically, which dials down our mental brain capacity. I mean, I was always smart. But when I had to carry around hundreds of extra pounds, right, I, did, I didn't have this, I, I, there was this block that I couldn't just put this intellect into these kinds of conversations. And I wanted to be, again, because no one was really seeing me. There was this constant need to, 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 to um, well, it made me a great listener. And what I would do is I would listen so intensely. I would listen for 95% of the conversation and then when I was about ready to start saying, okay, I've integrated all of this, here's some wisdom, the person would be like, well, let me get this phone. They, they would hang up on me just at the point when I was Sherlock solving the crime, when I'd be like, I've taken everything in. And again, you know, I showed up and said, I can actually reverse Parkinson's. I have spent years on this. 
the person has to do the work and the person has to spend, invest the time to come with me on this journey of this theory, which is basically what this call's about. That I, I believe that my partner, Gary, if he will watch this and he might not have the mental fitness, yeah. he may be triggered about the, that our partnership ended. And I hope he's not because there you are and you're in the network. You can get a physio wherever he's at who can mm -hmm. watch what we've just done, who can, then the physio can come to me and I can say, here's what I know to, because I know his personal story. Because we were business partners and we, I know what parts to really focus in on. So what was that injury? What was this that happened in his childhood? How did it into that? He doesn't have to go through it even himself anymore. Mm. There's somebody else who can tell the physio. So what I want you to do is he basically got diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome at the same time as Parkinson's. Wow. And that happens much more than anybody. What happens is then you're, the doctor says, take this L-dopa, take this medicine. And they stop being treating the physical symptoms because how Parkinson's always gets diagnosed. People don't come to the doctor. I think I got Parkinson's. Not a single human being has ever went to the doctor and said, can you die? I think I've, I've no, they're, they're showing up with the inability. They can't stop a tremor in their right hand. They're, you know, they're, they're coming with actual... history, all those things like familial history. I think that one of the things, you know, that people, you know, you're coming from a philosophical viewpoint and that by nature, physios are very practical people. Yes. You know, and yeah. we have some physios in our field who will say, oh, you know, certain things that you come up with are fluff. It's fluff. And it's fluff because maybe they don't understand it or they, don't, they can't connect to it or it doesn't, because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit like religion. Well, you know, just believe in God because I told you. You know, and God looks like this because he's painted like this, or Jesus looks like this because he's painted like this. So because I've given you an image, now you can relate to it, right? Mm -hmm. But some of the things that you're telling people when they don't have something tangible to see, feel, smell, or touch, right. it's difficult for them to be able to actually say, oh, this is fluff. And unless I can get you to do X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to make sense. And I think that what we must remember um, and I wrote this in a poem and I actually did put it on LinkedIn and it was called, did I take you for granted? Mm. You know? And, and one of the things mm. in my, within my first line talks about, you know, I thought that you were familiar to me. Mm. I thought that I, despite my limited knowledge, I thought that I knew you, you know, yeah. you're so deep, so deep. The reality is, we all drive cars, but how many of us really know much about the pistons, the engines? Oh. We don't, but we still drive the car every single day without knowing even 10% about it. A light comes up on the dash, you're Googling what that light is, you're trying to get out your logbook. Or you're not, you're just giving it to a guy. You're, you don't even oh, know what the not. light means. You drive it to the last, you hope that the light doesn't mean that the car's gonna conk out any minute now, you know? <laughs> And actually, this is what we do to our own bodies as humans. Perfect. So the reality is there are never any, never any complete practical solutions that you have this and this means all I have to do is this. Because if that were the case, every rotator cuff injury that came into me, I'd have a protocol that I walked with every time and it would work every time. Everyone who had cervicogenic headaches or, you know, had a meniscal injury of the knee or, you know, swelling of, you know, joint effusion, I would be able to apply the same thing every time yes. and it would work. The reality is I can't do that. And if I so much as think about doing that, that, that person's body very quickly tells me that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. It very sharply tells me that, no, that's not gonna work. Whether that's them being in more pain, whether that's them having less function, whether that's them getting a problem elsewhere, you know, it was my knee, but now it's moved into my hip or now it's in my ankle. Yeah. So you, I never take for granted that when somebody comes in that, oh, because they told me this and I think it's that and I'm driving towards that as a diagnosis. I never take it for granted that, so, somewhere along the line their body's going to come in with this curve ball <laughs> that makes me go shoot I've got that wrong yeah. I haven't got that right or it is that but it's coupled with this or 
actually I've treated the two things that I think have arisen. And now that I've done those, like you talked about, you know, um, getting rid of the pounds, when you do this and you treat the two problems that you think that were there, it brings out the primary problem yes. that was always the main issue in the first place. Childhood neglect. Childhood emotional neglect. And this is where we're going to dial this down because this has been about 90 minutes. I want to say that I'm going to have you give me how people can contact you. We'll put it on YouTube. So it'll be right there in the YouTube description. Um, you and I are going to keep doing this. We're not going to make plans because who knows. But the second you, you think of me, you want to reach out, we can do a little bit more of this. We can see if we can pull it, make it less. I mean, we just, we went with our brains and our brains love to play. But we can, we can do this very analytical for other people on a topic and maybe make it more like a 15 or 20 minute. So there's, there's whatever you want to do. Let's think about that. But I am honored to know you, Leanne Antoine. I am honored to know you. Thanks for having me. I, I, I just, this is just, you, you know, you've given me hope. You, you've helped me go, <laughs> I don't need to check on my mental health for like weeks now. That there's a certainty that there's another human yeah. and another country doing real work with human phys bodies. So I can, I can work on mental fitness and you're working on it. Then we just come together every now and again and say, please remember both and. Yes. Please work on your mental fitness, then your physical fitness, then your mental fitness, then your physical fitness. So, thank you for having me. So lovely to know you, really, really. And I will send you the URL to this. I'll probably get it up on the internet probably by tomorrow morning. So, no worry. Wait there a second. Let me just see, just very quickly before we round up. Yep. I wanted to finish with it because I think it's, I think it will be food for thought for anybody who watches this and I, does actually end up getting to the end. It's, it's, it's 100%. I mean, we, we, we're like the same woman. Yeah. <laughs> Entirely different, but it's like we're, we, we operate our human bodies the same. So go for it. I, I want you to, I want you to share. I mean, I'm not in any real rush. I just wanted to, otherwise we'd be talking for hours. So no, well, that's, that's what and I yeah. the video to around 90 I, minutes. I, so people I understand. Help. Just give me two seconds. Yeah, she there's, there's in her life. Because again, people, this okay. is impromptu TV. We did not yeah, exactly. there wasn't, share yeah. all this intelligence with any plan. Okay, so are we ready? Yeah. Um, did I take you for granted? I thought that I knew you, at least I thought you were familiar to me. I thought that my understanding of you, although limited, was enough to get me through. Did I take you for granted? The world is your oyster. We still have time. 2020 is still your year. Everything will be just fine. I still can't help but ask, did I take you for granted? Normality, we all shout, as we stand there with our selfie pouts. Give me back what I used to know, this virtual life, is making me bow. Did I take you for granted? Even though I could see the world getting smaller, some of us still felt like we were ballers. Humble, loving, self-care, time. Words that spring to the forefront of my mind. On the one hand, our world seems so divided, misguided and undecided. But today we stand united in our emotions, ready to save the oceans, just so we can leave this commotion. Our world is such a beautiful place, but I can't help but wonder, did I take it for granted? That's the end. <laughs> so folks, I know you didn't see this coming, but she's also a voiceover artist, it's clear. <laughs> This is this is this is this is another one of her jobs. Like our mentor, we like to have multiple streams of income. And the reason I I am really you know first off it was phenomenal. I mean I'm so glad that you shared your poem and that you performed it in such a deep way. But folks, this is RRX. This is literally the RX of a philosopher and a physiotherapist. Get your creativity on. Whether it's dancing, singing, poetry, when you, she's in, the, look at the joy, 
Look at the two of us. This is how we're going, we know that we don't have to worry about catching the virus. We don't have to, we're not stuck in the lower emotions. We're adapting every day. It's get your creativity on whatever that is. If it's, you know, whittling wood or if it's cooking for your family, don't limit it, but get into that because that zone is what helps your body go, okay, it's time to heal. That helps your body be able to prioritize a virus or again, there's still colds and flu going I'm, around. I'm no. urging anyone who has felt burnout, anyone who has struggled to slow the pace of their life down, even if you are someone who treats other people to help to heal them. Yes. This is your reset time. And when you go back, you know, people like me, people like you who are offering services, but with a very different trajectory, mm -hmm. this is, you, you cannot put a price on us. No, you cannot. You say you cannot. Coming out on the other side, it will be for the right people to realize the value of the people that are helping them to invest in their health and well-being. Staying alive. I mean, staying alive is now a full-time job. We had got all comfy cozy and expected all, you know, electricity to flow, internet access. We could just have Amazon bring us a new machine. You know, the, the supply chain of computers. I talked about cars going extinct. The supply chain is a physical hardware. And this yeah. is actually something I'm going to be doing this afternoon. I'm basically going to help try to get Microsoft to not end of life Windows 7. The economic disadvantaged people around the, because I'm in Seattle, economic disadvantaged people around the globe who don't have phones, they have the old desktops running Win 7. I am certain there's a major contingent of people and you have to have access to the internet to be able to work. Right, yeah. So it's, it's literally become a global, just like shelter and food and water, access to the internet is what humanity has as a baseline in 2020. From 2020 forward, you better have this capacity. Yeah. How do you get the information? How do you get the knowledge? How do you learn to think so that you're not following Can fake news? Collaborate connect, collaborate, yeah. So, so many things. Leanne, oh, I'm here. You. You'll reach out when you're ready for the next one. I will do. Take care. All right, love you. Bye. Bye.